Go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We have a fantastic panel now uh, to talk about should banks prioritize social impact? The question of how organizations should integrate, if at all, social KPIs is one that I would argue over the past decade has gone backwards and forwards, and in fact, right at the moment is probably on the downswing, particularly if you live in the United States, where there are, in certain states, companies that are being prosecuted for integrating social profit, social ends, into their financial ends. So the question really is, is the prioritization of stakeholders over shareholders, or I would say stakeholders with shareholders, going to survive? Should banks, in particular, prioritize social impact? Because, of course, banks lead the agenda on this. And if banks do, then companies will. And if they don't, they won't. So we have a fantastic panel to discuss this. On my immediate left, we have Faisal Al Hamad, the CEO of the National Bank of Kuwait Wealth and Chair of NBK Capital. Next to him, Andrew Bester, the member of the management board and head of wholesale banking at ING Group. And on Andrew's left, Dr. Sidi Ulta, the president of the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa, Badia, I think it's, it's called. Faisal, let me just jump straight in and start with you, if I may. Um, how do you think about integrating, or do you think about integrating social impact into your business? And if you do, how do you think about it? How do you do it in such a way that it goes beyond rhetoric and in, into reality? Thank you, Zina. Um, we absolutely do. If we think of banking, banking is a community service. And that's the way we've been geared in NBK. Uh, I think it's more concentrated with us because we are in a small country um, and we serve our clients deeply. The social aspect is part and parcel of our DNA. We've believed in it from day one. We continue to believe in it. It's nothing new. We talked today about ESG and, and, and sort of the drive behind that. Um, the social side of it is something that we've been doing for years. It's part of the culture and has to be something that's led from the top down. And our belief is when leadership drives that change, stakeholders and investors gain in the circular economy. So we make sure that the strategy is clear. We're ensuring that what services we provide have a social impact. We try to assess how to quantify it. And then we also, frankly, infuse it in the objectives of businesses and objectives of management to ensure that we're tackling those issues. We also make a, a, a significant amount of effort trying to educate the market and stakeholders why it's important and why in the long term it's actually profit driven. And that's, that's technically what we've been doing recently and uh, uh, over the, the medium term in the NBK. Can I just pick up one thing you said there, which I think is important, you try to quantify it. So, you know, the, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. How do you actually quantify social sure. good? Sure. So we, we take, let's take one, one dimension, financial inclusion. I think when we talk about social impact, I think it's important to also look at different geographies and where they are in the stage of evolution mm -hmm. and what the requirements are. But we look at social inclusion. We've tied up in uh, NBK um, the digital side of the business with our first digital bank mm -hmm. that targets from now onwards, actually, eight-year-olds and up to build financial literacy and actually expand financial inclusion. That's quantifiable. We can, we can look at how many uh, people have signed up, and it's circa 200,000, uh, in this digital bank that were never banked, nor were able to understand really just the basics of ABC banking. And we, we think that's a very, very powerful way to make sure that financial literacy is built from the ground up at a young age and helps people make the right decisions long term. Faisal, I want to pick up something you said, but I'm actually going to turn it to Andrew, if I may. Um, this idea of persuading the people around you, persuading your stakeholders that this matters. And Andrew, you and I were talking about this earlier. How do you persuade investors that actually they have to look beyond just the share price, just the profit line? 
Well, certainly, when, when, when you think about a bank, firstly, what do we do? We look after people's savings, and we deploy that responsibly in the economy. So take ING, we have $650 billion of people's savings. So the challenge is, how do we deploy that, those deposits re responsibly? So for me, it's very simple. You need to be clear what you're doing for your customers. You need to be clear what you're doing for your community. And in reality, in banking, you can't just simply look at profit. Profit is an important driver for our shareholders, but we need to be very aware of our societal responsibility. And banks carry that over generations. So you have to look at all the different aspects together. So I'm sold, but if I'm sitting in Texas right now and I'm going, what about your bottom line? You are spending resources on things that aren't impacting your bottom line. What would you say to them? So I think that if you look for the long term, you can create shareholder value and make sure that you are driving um, a strategy that aligns all aspects. And certainly when I think about what we're doing at ING around sustainability and how we help our clients think towards a sustainable future, that is about profitability as well. It's not simply about driving a social good. We, it can and does have social positive benefit, but we think about our strategy in an integrated way. So it's how do we drive superior client value, but also have sustainability at the heart. And our whole bank strategy and all 65,000 colleagues are working towards trying to achieve that. And what happens if those two things are not in, in line with one another? What happens when you have to start making choices? Because the economy has has been pretty painful for the last five years. You know, we were talking earlier about the financial crisis 15 years ago, plus or minus, 10 years ago. Um, what happens when you actually have to start making choices? How do you then persuade that actually this is a choice even though it's not the bottom line? How do you persuade that this actually matters? It's a great question. I mean, I think a lot of what you need to do is there are always gonna be dilemmas because you're trying to assess, in the banking business, you're trying to assess decisions you make today and the risks that they may or may not create 10 or 15 years down the line. If you go back to the learnings from the financial crisis, there were unsustainable practices in banking that manifested themselves after the financial crisis. So as a senior banking executive, you're looking at how you manage risk over the long term, and that absolutely includes the conduct in the organization, the decisions you make on your loans. So you're always looking to the long term when you make decisions today. It's the nature of our business. And as a man who we were talking earlier, You've been called in on more than one occasion to, my words, not yours, but reform <laughs> banks. Um, and you've been up close and personal with some of the costs that come about because banks haven't performed maybe as well as they should have. Um, are there any kind of specific examples you could give us about how those, you know, that, that idea of risk reward, the kind of risks of not getting it right. So, I mean, not, not necessarily get into all the specifics of my, my own personal experience, but what I certainly learned and had to fix was a number of very serious issues that went wrong in the financial system. And if I take my career, I spent the first 10 years post the financial crisis repairing things that went wrong, whether those were conduct fines, whether there were unsustainable business practices that created multi-billion dollar fines and, and, and resettlement. So when you see that as a bank, it makes you very humble about the responsibility you carry today and how do you take that forward and act as, as a responsible custodian of your own institution. It also presumably enables you to say to people, if we don't act in this way, there is a real tangible cost to not acting in this way. There is. And, and the way I think about it, it's about how do you run the organization sustainably, responsibly for the long term. Yeah. And that is not about... ESG, it's about how do we responsibly run the organization. So there's, there's, I'm going to come back to you, but I, yeah. want, to, I want to come to City now. Um, but I think that, that that word long term or words long term is one that maybe we can come back on mm. because in the corporate world, we're measured by the short term so often. In, in the political world, we're measured by the short term. So how do you keep people invested in the long term, even while people are expecting returns on the short term? But Sidi, let me come to you. Um, the international organizations, the UN, the UN um, government organizations are, are increasingly putting in place guidelines or standards to arguably create a level playing field so that all banks have to act in certain, all financial institutions act, have to act in certain ways. Um, are they actually changing the way people act? Are they having an impact yet? And if not, what can we do differently? What can you do differently 
to actually make sure they do, or is it a lost cause? No, uh, allow me at the outset to tell you that development finance institutions, such as uh, the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa, are by design ESG compliant. Because uh, our shareholders established this institution not to make money, but to make impact. So all our projects are designed in a way to, to, to have an impact and to be sustainable and to take into consideration the environmental dimension, the social dimension, and the governance dimension. Now, let us talk about commercial banks. Commercial banks are, by definition, profit maker. But today, in today's world, there is a, great, uh, a growing awareness about the importance of long-term uh, vision and also the, the importance of sustainability. Of course, what you have mentioned about organization, about uh, international organization, UN and guidelines is important. But more importantly, investors themselves are increasingly giving more importance to, uh, to, to the sustainability dimension. If you go today to a cap the capital market to issue bonds, if your bonds are labeled social or green, you will fetch better pricing than if you go with the conventional uh, bonds. So investors themselves, pension fund and uh, insurers, and even uh, individuals, are now go great, uh, giving uh, great attention to sustainability. And also at the level of the corporate and uh, at the level of the bank, shareholders are no longer only looking at the financial damage, but they, have, they are rather to, to king, uh, the, taking the balance scorecard. And the balance scorecard will, will not only look at the financial dimension, but will, will, will look at the other dimension. My understanding, however, is that actually <coughs> the amount of investment that's going into green investment um, is decreasing, not increasing. Is that not true? I'm not sure what data you're looking at, but I can, I can, I can uh, you know, we just issued our first green bond. Yeah. And uh, there are pockets, obviously in the US, I think there's a different direction the US is taking versus European investors. European investors we found have been doubling down on ESG to a certain degree. And we found that the appetite for the green bond was higher than the conventional bond yeah. and allowed us to price tighter. So I think it depends on who where the investors sit. are and where you sit and what market you're sort of attracting in terms of investor base. Yeah, I think, I think one's got to look uh Look beyond the headlines. So if I take, for example, at ING, last year we, we mobilized 115 billion euros of financing for, 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 for sustainability. This year, the first half, up 12%. So sometimes one does need to look through it. Are there some geographic shifts within that across our 40 country network? Yes, but overall, we continue to see increased demand, be they for green bonds, be they for financing. So I see it as yes, the, the, the picture is evolving, but actually overall as a global bank, as I say, we saw double-digit growth last year, or this year, so, so far. So for everybody here on this panel, in a sense, it's not an even-handed panel, because everybody, it sounds like, on this panel says, yes, banks need to continue prioritizing social profit as well as, as, well as uh, financial profit. So let's look forward for a second. Let's, let's fast forward 10, 10 years out. How will this industry be different 10 years from now than it is today? Um, what would you say to the people in the room who are leading banks, working in banks, working in other financial institutions? What should they be thinking about? Because this is what the world's going to look like a decade from now. Any of you? Yeah. Go ahead. So d definitely, in uh, the, the long-term vision for banks should be guided by, by the consideration of corporate social responsibility, sustainability, and governance. And these are the, the, the key element of the ESG compliance uh, guidelines. More and more, co b b commercial bank will, will be inclined to take this dim dimension in their business plan, rather than focusing only on, on the making, uh, profit making. Because at the end of the year, if we don't save our planet, and if we don't take into consideration the social dimension, and if we don't Im improve our governance, we will not be making any profit. So what will be the same is we'll still be taking people's savings and deploying them responsibly in the economy. I think in this particular area, 
I think what we'll see is deeper codification of what is best practice. I think the measurement systems will be enhanced because we're in a phase where there's a huge amount of regulation happening across the world um, in terms of how these things get measured and monitored. I think the key, though, as leaders in banking is you need to stay ahead of where the regulation is today. So I think we will see more regulation, but I think the universal truths of banking will still be adding value in society in a responsible way. So I think, again, uh, there's no one-size-fits-all. I think in different markets, different geographies, things will improve in different ways. But what I can say full-heartedly is I think the data will be better. Mm -hmm. If you look at markets and emerging markets, the data is not there yet. I mean, if we're talking about some of the metrics earlier, it's very tough to understand and quantify where you are. In 10 years, I full-heartedly believe that the data will be phenomenal and we'll be able to adjust even uh, more efficiently to the, to the new paradigm. Which you kind of asked me, my, you answered my, or started to answer my final question, which is how is technology going to change this? And your answer is technology will permit the, or facilitate data. I, I think the build, first building block is data, right? Yeah. And I think you know, once we have that, we're able to then adjust business plans, adjust sustainability views, adjust our business model accordingly. You agree? Yeah, better tracking, more transparency, um, better measurement of, uh, of the impact that we're having. And definitely artificial intelligence will, will bring a, a, a leapfrog, will, will enable the, uh, the investor to leapfrog uh, in, in, into the next generation of uh, banks. So one final question just to close, which is, I'll go back to one I think I asked you, which is this idea of how do you manage when those two things are in conflict? Because I don't think there's a person in the room. If it were easy, if you could do social good and profit, you'd do it, right? I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer. Where it gets challenging is where you have to take profits, decrease those profits in order to achieve a social end. So how do you think about that? Just say a word for people in this room of how you think about balancing those or how do you think about analyzing those things? It's, it's mainly about thinking about short-term profit and long-term loss. It's an arbitrage to do between short-term gain and long-term loss. So it's better to have a moderated uh, profit on, uh, on a long-term perspective. So it's thinking long-term is your... So think about the decision you make today when someone looks back in 10 years' time and says, did you make a good decision? Oh, that's a really interesting one. <laughs> I like that. It's getting the different perspective and looking backwards and saying, will I be able to, to defend to this? Back. Love it. We do that a lot in coaching. I love it. <laughs> Go ahead, Faisal, bring us home. For me, it's fundamentally about resource management. We do it every day, whether it's credit risk or ESG risk, it's part of the thought process. And it'll evolve and it's something that we have to continue doing. Okay. Andrew, Faisal, Sidi, thank you so much. You. Short but sweet. Um, and I, you know, we agree. Fantastic. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.